chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about the devastation of inspiration. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Eli Pope are Paul J. McSorley, Drew Blood, Jeff Sturdivant, and Melissa Medina. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Eli Pope and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley, with some amazing help from Drew Blood, Jeff Sturdivant, and Melissa Medina. Well, friends, they say that every time an author writes a story, they put a piece of themselves into the final product. Some more than others. Now, without further ado, I present to you, The Narrator. I'm hearing static. There's a voice echoing. You hear that? My mic is live. Echo one, check status on the mic. Fuck, we're live. Go to break. Now. You're listening to 107.9 Puppet Channel. Your puppet host, Puppet, crisp and bright. Listen to your music with our new Plasmodium Enhanced Standard Digitized Sound. Puppet's new Generation 5 earbuds. It's sex for your ears. If it isn't Plasmodium, it isn't from Puppet. Available only on Puppet.Global.com, Puppet Corp., the corporation taking care of all your personal and global wants and needs. We're here for you, 24-7. Echo 1, we are back on target, and camera 228 just caught motion. Crackles are cleared, transmission problem appears to be eradicated. That was close, Echo 1. Mr. Pope has entered his garage, and he's readying his electric glide. Are cameras 268 and 270 good for go? Over. Charlie 7, Echo 1 is free and clear. Awaiting narrator to pass control. Over. Echo 1, visual control is available and ready to accept from present time forward. Puppet master control engaged. Clear. The garage door slowly rose, and seconds later... A classic bright sapphire blue overgloss black 2010 Harley Davidson Ultra Limited was seen parked, tilted on its stand to the left, nose pointed outside, ready to roll. Eli Pope lifted his leg and straddled the 107 cubic inch V twin motor, quickly hitting the starter button, bringing the rumbling beast to life. It was time for his nightly ride to unwind and clear his head. The roads outside of the city where he lived 
or where he drew his inspiration. The wind in his face, the sound of his favorite retro bands quaking from the bike stereo, masking the roar that exited the pipe behind him. This was the place he felt most comfortable. This and sitting at the coffee bar, his tablet open with its keys clicking letter after letter morphing into words, sentences, and paragraphs. Eli had grown to become a bit of a loner ever since his family was taken from him in a horrible robbery at the restaurant that they sat eating dinner at. It had taken a year after their memorial service to make any kind of appearance back into this new society he was uncomfortable with. The scene's bloody mess permanently imprinted in his mind. It hadn't been fair he was left unharmed and alive while his wife and boy had been slaughtered with no apparent reason. The case stood unsolved and was likely to remain that way, filed away in a folder in some detective's forgotten backlog of crimes with no real evidence left behind. Back in Black, a 1980s song from ACDC was first on his playlist. Like a ritual, Eli always pulled from his driveway onto the road that coaxed his brain to the next chapter of whatever he was working on. His neighbors knew his routine well. Annoyed at first, they all knew the suffering he still endured from his loss and quickly became accustomed to the loud sound of the machine, knowing it was his way of attempting to heal. Home base, this is Charlie 7. Hope is en route. I'm switching to camera 268 for a head-on visual. Over. Charlie 7, copy that. How does Hope's mood appear this evening? Home base, Hope appears, well, is normal. No significant change. Charlie 7, narrator would like an extra close watch on Pope. Over. Copy that, home base. Wind is in his hair, standard background music, and appears as standard Tuesday route as the chosen path. Pope can be read like a book. <laughs> home base, launch overhead drone to follow for aerial overview. Over. Charlie 7, affirmative on action. Initiating Drone 255 to intercept and lock onto Pope. Narrator will be overseeing tonight's mission. Over. Copy that, home base. Over. Eli never noticed the stealth drone that moved across the sky from the west and then slowed to a matching speed to Eli's Harley. Home base control now fluidly switched visuals throughout the three cameras focused on him. Two had been placed on his bike, hidden and unseen, along with the now following Skyview camera locked in place, mimicking every action and turn taken. Mr. Pope seemed to have no idea how closely Puppet was watching over him. I'm rolling thunder, pouring rain. I'm coming on like hurricane, ripped loudly from the Ultra's speakers. Hell's Bells was another ACDC favorite of Eli's. It was written and recorded in the Bahamas just after lead singer Bon Scott had passed. Production had been kept at a slowed pace because of strong storms messing with the studio's power. Eli held no clue of the similarities to the storm brewing over his head. He was just a nobody writer emptying his grief wrapped up tightly in his head and begging to be released. Therapy was what writing was to him, a way to bleed the pain hidden deep within his soul onto a form that was his antidote to a world he had no control over. Or so he thought. Hello, all you sexy men out there. Are you lonely tonight? You may be just who I'm looking for. A woman loves a certain scent on a man. Puppet knows what a woman wants and has recreated the specific aroma that drives her desire to be released and quenched. It's now available exclusively from Puppet.Global.com, genetically altered with plasmodium to release your strain of hormones into a fragrance that will drive her to succumb to desires she never knew existed. A spritz, a conversation, and a night you won't forget. Puppeteer. Instant yearning passion in a compact dispenser. She'll want you again and again. Welcome back, listeners. 
You've tuned into 107.9 Puppet Broadcasting, tickling your ears and teasing your brain with all the newest in technology, news, and music. We make your life simple. We make your life better. We give everything. Now for your listening pleasure, rock on with another oldie. This one from way back, Led Zeppelin. Communication Breakdown. Eli maneuvered his bike through the curves and hills of the surrounding countryside. It was shrinking, and he found himself having to ride further and further to escape people and new construction. The world around him was expanding. His brain struggled to shed all the bullshit of that overcrowded world of his daytime life. Work, city traffic, the boss... The fact that society was morphing into something he didn't understand. Something he felt a constant dread from. A co-worker had introduced him to something that gave him a quick boost. He knew it wasn't what he should be doing, but he also knew he had been consistently letting the world swallow a little more of his soul every day. He agonized of the loss of his wife and son. He missed the peripheral noise of them in his life. The silence now killed him bit by bit. His pit bull, Wheeler, seemed to also succumb to the mundane existence they now shared. Something was happening around them. Gone were the days of reassurance and comfort. Happiness and mental calm now came in short puffs from the small cartridge that held Puppet's secret formula, recently made legal to possess. The sheer thought of it called to him to reach up and open the pouch of his fairing in front of him and pull the black mechanism out and push the button on its side as he inhaled its vaporized content. Feeling the magic boost instantly, Eli's brain began to formulate an idea for his next story. If it panned out into something worthwhile by the time he returned, he'd give his narrator, Paul, a jingle and run it by him. It seemed to be the way things worked since since the tragedy that stole his normality. His chance meeting with Paul, a man who opened up Eli's opportunities to expand his audience, had seemed to be the closest thing to a miracle at a time he had needed it most. One can't wake up one day and have his world erased, taken from him with no warning in a violent and brutal way, and then begin to recover alone. It was as if he were a guardian angel steering him back on a path of recovery. Gone were the days of waking up on the floor, an empty bottle of whiskey not far from his reach. Wheeler's hunger causing him to lick his face in hopes of waking his dead ass from another drunken night stupor to fill his water and food bowls. If only Wheeler could talk in a language they both understood. It seemed as if Paul knew him internally, and was there to offer a new way to stir his creativity each time the old way of keeping him relevant to the world slipped through the cracks of the journey he was now on. Eli looked up to the sky above and screamed aloud, God, don't forsake me! You've taken everything from me! It's just me and my dog along with my pain and anguish! Why not just finish your vagary and steal away my life too? He reached for another pull from the pen that gave him a boost of the mind-bending dose he now needed. Give me back what I've earned from you taking everything, Lord! He twisted the throttle into the coming curve, as if to dare his maker to remove him from his sinking world by letting him slide from the asphalt in a death-defying angle onto the gravel shoulder and then over the edge of the chasm. The myriad of flat screens adorning the narrator's office were rectangular boxes filled with angles of moving images, all of only one person, a man he was very interested in. He wanted to know and control everything about him. He saw this soul which was teetering on the edge of a deep precipice, possibly being the exact puzzle piece that could fit into his plans. He wanted this individual to succeed with grandioso success. His plan was instrumental on this happening. Each screen that hung surrounding his desk showed one troubled puppet. 
Eli Pope. His hair was blowing in the wind, his darkened sunglasses reflecting back into the many lenses focused on him. The emotionless picture of a man torn between wanting to leave this earth while begging it to accept him and give him what he longed for. Clarity of why he was still alive. Why he was left behind. He was a man on the edge. He held something none other did. He was his dark angel who could be the instrument to take over. Eli was a prophet of sorts who knew nothing of the power he held within. Given the correct mix of all the tools the narrator held at his disposal would be crucial in blending and formulating Eli to be the unlikely leader he needed him to be. Ah, Eli, my dear, dear friend, I will offer you your cure as long as it takes. I'll give you the experiences that draw your words and become the fame you need to be my soldier for the world I will rule. Come to me. Take what I give you. <laughs> he cackled, ending with an insidious hiss. He reached for the console in front of him and twisted a glowing knob, zooming the camera lens in pulling the image of Eli's face into a super-magnified view that held the clarity of a moving picture sharper than reality. What are you thinking behind those dark shades, Mr. Pope? Are you swallowing in the possibility of the fame and fortune I can give you? Maybe, just maybe... Even the warmth and comfort to fill the inside of your broken shell? Paul asked in a hopeful voice as the screen displayed his inhaling once again from the pen that delivered the vapor of his medicinal concoction. Oh, yes, Eli. Suck in the mist and let it dull your curiosity of this world and instead conform you to paint it full of the colors I needed to be. <laughs> he hissed again as he pushed different buttons, causing the screens to change the different angles, all of the same man he had put his entire stock in. I'll give you the next performance of your lifetime. I'll turn your words into an audible elixir for your, <laughs> our patrons, to become drunken with. I will make you, before I use you and break you, my puppet. The narrator's eyes glazed over, slightly masking the evil intent he held within, as all the screen's images began to blur, filling the entire room with only one image made large by fitting the puzzle pieces of each screen into one giant image of Eli's face hiding behind the darkened lenses that masked his puppet's true thoughts. A sharp image reflected back through the lens, a horizon painted with a colorful sunset and the Ozark Mountains in the foreground. Eli's face still showed the hint of his internal despair through the tiny pulses in his skin. He couldn't hide his fears or dread behind his dark shades any more than an alcoholic could hide his addiction through denial. I'll own you, Eli. Echoed across the open channel before the narrator realized he had bumped the wrong toggle. Fuck! Was the last word transmitted over Puppet's channel before Paul flipped the toggle back into the proper position and resumed the programmed music. Eli throttled back, causing his Harley to sound even throatier with the back pressure as the word fuck sank in. What the fuck mimicked in his mind? Where did that come from? After hearing nothing out of the ordinary, he assumed it was imagined, maybe from too much of inhaled mist, and he twisted the grip further back, bringing the motor to return to a louder rumble as he leaned into the next curve. 
daring it to be the one who won in pulling him into the trees that lined the highway. Charlie 7 to home base. Subject is stopped and is sitting on a park bench at Shadow Rock, requesting Puppet Master to create link with Pope's laptop and maintain recording. Over. Roger that, Charlie 7. Maintaining drone in hover mode and linking to laptop. Narrator is observing and will maintain visual and close to pocket. Over. Eli inhaled another dose of vapor as his fingers continued to tap on the keys of his laptop. The narrator continued to manipulate the controls of the cameras. Using the laptop's camera, the narrator zoomed the focus onto Eli's eyes as he pushed his shades to nestle on top of his head, tangled into his whitening, windblown hair. The reflection of the laptop screen mirrored the image into the camera lens to the enlarged screens hanging on the narrator's wall surrounding him. A smile washed over his dried lips. He could sense his plans working out. Eli was deepening his need of the things he could provide. He would finalize his battle for complete control over his puppet, pulling the strings he held, controlling his actions in aid of taking over the entity he had battled for thousands of years. This final war that would end all wars would be determined by him, not his eternal enemy known as the Creator. The narrator's fingers tapped the keys and soon he hit send. He would watch as Eli read his message. He would study Eli's reaction and determine just how close he was to winning him over completely. Eli's followers were growing like bamboo spreading quickly and choking out all other things that didn't succumb. Eli's written voice, using his words, would draw the multitude of souls to his underworld of darkness for good. He sat back and blankly stared at his unwitting partner as Eli began to read the message he just sent. Eli, my good friend, our listeners are craving another story from you. I believe you've played with them long enough. They are ready for something with a much deeper meaning. They're hungry for change. Give them a story that entices them. No, that's not a strong enough word. Give them words demanding. They become frequent users of Puppet's cognizant vapor pen. Let them know its healing powers that it holds. How it's helped you heal and grow. Elevate them on its ability to give them the true mind-opening view on the world and its attempt to manipulate them into the machine. Fiction with a heavy dose of reality. Make them feel the disappointment of our government leaders and the false religious prophets. All the bullshit they're being blindly fed. Eli, my friend, I'm asking you to willingly be their prophet. Our prophet. Warn them in a way that demands they turn in opposition to the masses. You know yourself how well it teaches. It's time to become drunk with our truth. Make us famous, Eli. Be the voice of their future. Our future. I trust in you. Brothers in arms. Paul. Paul, the narrator, who is truthfully far more of a master manipulator than Eli ever realized, sat behind his console and observed his soldier's reaction. Using the control panel, he manipulated the camera angles as he recorded each action with purpose. He was creating a spokesperson, a snake oil salesman for his products, his vision, his battle. He was beginning to tug the strings of his puppet he was creating with more intent, his Pinocchio, who wanted to be real again. He smiled as he witnessed his work beginning to come to fruition. The sparkle in Eli's eyes brightened as if he had been given charge of a mission that he knew he could accomplish. He was so broken. He had become very susceptible to Paul's manipulation without realizing it. He had put all his trust into Paul. He had no one else. 
<laughs> Paul cackled an evil laugh ending with his dark hiss as he sat back in his crimson red leather chair. He touched the tip of his fingers together as each screen from every angle once again zoomed into one huge combined image that clearly portrayed his Pinocchio swallowing his intent-filled lies like a baby lapping up ice cream, clueless of just who Paul really was and the poison he was ingesting. Hello, listeners. Puppet.global.com has done it again. Our new line of plasmodium-based fabrics used in our clothing line actually holds the ability to dial in just how much of our mood-elevating product you want absorbed into your system. You can now appear stylishly dressed in trend-setting fashion while maintaining that enhanced mood all day long. Puppet Fashions, clothing for the future, brought to you in the present. Available exclusively on puppet.global.com. Charlie 7, narrator is returning camera feed control back to home base. Mr. Pope has arrived back at his residence and the house is secured for the evening. Roger that, Echo 1. We will maintain visual. Eli entered his home through the garage door, backpack with laptop over his shoulder. Today had been a mentally challenging one. Those memories that are constantly pushed to the dark corners of mental shelves were clawing their way back into his psyche. He had done a day's battle fighting to keep them at bay. The use of his puppet pen had become his weapon of choice. Today's world was entirely different than even two years ago when his family was still here. Puppet Corps seemed to be overtaking the world with their almost sudden outbreak of products. He knew deep down that something so easy and available certainly had a backlash of problems that would become apparent at some point. Plasmodium. Just what the hell is it? Other than the all-new miracle drug cure-all for everything? Eli pulled his laptop out of the bag and set it on the coffee table. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled the vape device out and laid it beside the laptop. It's a knot for quelling the pangs of pain in the old-fashioned way. Whiskey. He walked over to the kitchen and opened the farthest left upper cabinet door. It was a place he had avoided for months, but wasn't ready to be shed of its contents for good. You just never know when a knot like this may pop in out of nowhere. His fingers reached for the single bottle from his recent past, which stood strong and stoically alone on the top shelf. Have you been lonely, my dear and dangerously familiar friend? In a fluid muscle motion, his other hand pulled a crystal highball glass from the adjacent cabinet. Pulling the cork from the bottle of George Dickel, using his teeth, he slowly poured the contents, leaving just enough room to add a cube or two of ice. Paul watched the monitor closely as Eli drew the glass to his lips and allowed the liquid into his mouth. Eli's eyes appeared to brighten momentarily as the whiskey's burn was likely allowed to settle on his tongue. He knew Eli didn't just drink for the benefit of watering down his woes. Eli truly loved the aroma and taste. The mild burn was merely an enjoyable bonus in the harmony of value the whiskey gave him. Ah, Mr. Dickel, Eli spoke in a softened tone. There are some gifts of delight that Puppet just can't duplicate. Thank you for your labors of love that give me what the other refuses to offer, George. Paul's cheeks burned with the acknowledgement his failure to hold total control over Eli. I thought that power was mine and had become uncontested, was the thought that mixed like oil into water inside his thoughts. The narrator was confronted once more with the knowledge his powers were not strong enough to hold the capabilities of force. He only held the power of limited deception. That deception was working slowly in the masses with his drug, but he needed a puppet like Eli desperately in order to close his deal upon the world. Paul's stomach began to churn. He despised the fact the creator had banished him from his presence into a world where he had become half-human, mixing with his angelic beginnings. 
A dark angel can only do so much at a time. He spoke aloud as he continued to observe the digital screens adorning his lair. It may be time to move on to my second act. Moving too hastily was always a potential mistake, but it appears Eli is wavering at the bait. The world is ripening for coup. My window will not remain open for long. Paul lifted his glass as if he were beside a good friend sharing a drink. Paul lifted his libation as if to toast with Eli as he intently watched his wall-sized image of his disciple appear to be struggling with his past. After taking a rather long draw from his glass and returning it to his granite slab desktop, he felt something begin to drip down from his mouth. Touching his finger to the corner and dabbing, he held his finger out to investigate. The blood-red liquid stood out brightly on his fingertip. He felt weak and drained all of a sudden. It was beginning to happen. He glanced back to the live image of Eli. Was his disciple morphing into his nemesis? Paul's office darkened as the digital wall filled with Eli's vacant visage began to dim. <sighs> the bright sun burst through the open shades of Eli's living room. A nearly empty bottle of George Dickel remained standing beside an empty highball glass. A tattooed sleeved arm dangled from the couch, fingers a brighter red as they barely rested upon the floor. A very subtle blue flicker of light popped briefly on, then off, from a corner sconce that hung on the room's wall. There was a tiny hole just below the top rim that remained unnoticeable to an unsuspecting eye. Echo 1, this is Charlie 7. Come back. Charlie 7, Echo 1 online. What can I do for you this morning? Roger. Narrator is wanting the overnight video footage of Pope downloaded and copied to home base immediately. Roger. Will do, Charlie 7. Can you give specifics of why? Just curious. Better not to ask, Echo 1. Narrator is very unhappy with progress and mission. Over. File is downloaded and preparing package to send, Charlie 7. Over. Copy that. Sit tight after transmitting. Over. Eli's body began to stir slightly. A low groan from deep inside his gut escaped from his lips as he attempted to roll to his other side. His hand lifted from the floor and up to his head while his eyes slowly began to widen, allowing the light to wake him. A pain of whiskey. It was a ritual he had all but forgotten since being introduced to the puppet vape. As he drug his fingertips over his eyes and cleared the sleep, Eli glimpsed around his surroundings, slowly realizing that he was in his living room. Oh, he moaned. Tell me I didn't. He continued. His eyes caught the sparkle of the glass and bottle on the coffee table. Fuck. I knew I should have gotten rid of you, George. He slowly rolled up from his side to a seated position. What have I done? He calmly and quietly asked himself, as if there were two of him in the room. Conversations with myself again, huh? That's what I'm back to? He looked up to the picture on the wall that hung above his stereo system. I'm sorry, Mary. I didn't mean to let you and Cole down. He stared at the large black and white portrait of his wife and son. It was the last picture taken of the two together. Not too long before... Eli's head dropped in shame. I just miss you both so... so much. His head lifted as his eyes met theirs. <laughs> I love you. I should have done more to try and save you both. The night's dreams re-entered his thoughts. It almost felt as if it were happening live. The bell over the door dinging, announcing another customer entering. He had felt an odd discomfort at seeing men in hoodies in the reflection of the hanging mirror when they stepped across the threshold. The evening's brisk air quickly followed them in and rushed down the aisles, chilling the entire restaurant in an instant. Eli's back had been to the front entrance. It was unusual for him to be seated that way, 
but Mary and Cole quickly squeezed into the booth before he could. He hadn't wanted to make a deal out of it, so he didn't. Instead, Eli quietly slid into the seat. The minute the bell rang from the entrance door hitting it, a bitter cold breeze blew its cold breath and out of instinct, he had looked to the mirror at the announcement of new arrivals. Eli began turning just as Mary's eyes reflected an unusual uneasiness. It was a reflex out of instinct as he reached for his concealed handgun, but it was an instant too late. The first loud pop caused a jolt accompanied by the burn in his left shoulder. The second bang shot throughout his left side, causing him to fall forward into the table before rolling to the left to the floor. Blood spatter covered his wife and son's faces along with their upper torsos as they sat in complete shock, Cole's young hands covering his ears. Eli could never forget that frightened and shocked look his son bore in his eyes. His wife, Mary, instinctively grabbing him and attempting to cover his body like a shield. It all happened so quick, but yet dragged in painfully slow flickers, like pictures being scrolled through in the stop-action jerks of an old black-and-white movie. Eli wasn't sure why these images had been locked up so tightly in his mind. Ever since he had replaced the whiskey with the vape pen his psychologist had insisted, these flashbacks had slowed to almost extinction. She had told him this was good and that it meant he was beginning to allow himself to move forward. But this morning? This morning, these mental images seemed to appear much more focused on details he had noticed before. His past memories paled next to these mental snapshots that were fighting for his attention now. He could picture minute details he had not drawn on when he was being questioned at the station the night of. His hands went back to his head as he fought off the aches attempting to throb inside his brain. Was it just part of the hangover? Or was it something inside him that realized all had not been as it appeared to be? Had I somehow been duped from the beginning? He began to quiz himself. Think, damn it. The words slipped from his mouth out loud and he strained his brain to see more in the images inside his head. Is this my hell? My price for not saving my family? He sat straight up on the couch and stared at the bottle of Dickel on the coffee table. He looked over to the kitchen, which the door to the garage was. The keys to his bike were dangling on the hook beside the door jam. I need to clear my head. He spoke as he stood up and hesitated a moment before dragging one leg in front of the other towards the key fob that was practically screaming his name. Very little time delayed between the thought and action. He was through the door with the key in hand in mere seconds as the garage door opened, letting the late morning light break in. Charlie 7. Come in, Charlie 7. This is Echo 1. We have movement. I repeat, Eli is mounting his bike and heading out the garage door. This is Charlie 7. Echo 1, I am at control and switching over to bike cameras and drone. Over. A small drone quickly rose from the roof of Eli's home and began following Eli as he roared off on his Harley. The engine's throaty roar was only a few decibels softer than the tune blaring out from the bike's speakers. The AC-DC tune, back in black, reverberated off of Eli's body, only to disappear into the distance. Eli's hair blew freely in the wind without his helmet caging the graying strands. He looked down at the speedo and saw the needle pushing 85 miles per hour. He knew his brain focused better with his face in the wind and bike screaming for more throttle. He pushed those limits as he continued to focus on what he may have subliminally seen but not registered at the time of the attack at the restaurant. Those damned hooded figures. The one figure on the left. The one with the small symbol. There was something about how that one moved differently. Eli knew where he was headed. It was the only place he held anymore that seemed sacred. He only had one friend left. He'd withdrawn from everyone else after losing his family. After all, no one ever knows how to react to someone who has suffered the kind of loss he had suffered. Blank looks of emptiness were what he remembered the day of putting his wife and son to rest. Awkward moments of pain silence 
while the people standing in front of him silently begged for that moment they could move away and down the line towards the ones they didn't feel the same need for closure or permission to step aside. Death was a difficult thing to share, no matter which side of the loss you were standing. But Paul always felt different. It was as if he held no ties to anything containing humanity. Eli had always felt it a bit odd, but comforting. It was almost the same way he had felt his entire life until... Mary and Cole. A lot of things changed after that day. Eli would again seek shelter under his friend's wing. Paul would know what to say, or what not to say. He would push another story idea under Eli's skin to help soak away his troubles and bring him back into focus. That's what Paul did for him. Paul had promised not only a mind free from pain eventually, he had promised him a life of praise and gratitude from his followers. He had promised he would be part of a change in this world that would cause an entirely new dimension. If Eli would only trust in him and write what he needed him to write, Paul had told him that he himself was the one to narrate Eli's words, but he wasn't able to actually write them. He could aid in their orchestration, but it took Eli's hands and mind to put them on paper. And that is what he had been concentrating on. Change was good. Change was necessary. This world was crumbling, and until Paul had entered into the mix, it all seemed hopeless. Paul will know how to bring me back, Eli yelled at the top of his lungs. Tears were beginning to blur his vision, but it didn't force Eli to push the throttle forward and slow his ride down. Instead, he twisted it back further as the twin cylinders thumped faster in time, the exhaust thundering louder, escaping behind him in an echoey rumble. Home base, this is Charlie Seven. Come in. I see him, Charlie Seven. Clear all guards from sight. I don't want him to see a soul when he pulls into the drive. Have the gatekeeper open the gates upon immediate arrival. Yes, sir. Roger that, Puppet Master. Out. Seconds later, the faint sound of Eli's Harley could be heard as it worked its way through the twisted road to Paul's estate's main gate. It was open as Eli made the turn and rumbled past the guard. As Eli dismounted, his attention was drawn to look upward as the small drone quickly banked and disappeared behind a gable. The side door to the estate flew open as Eli turned and made his way towards Paul, who was standing in the entryway. You have drones now? Feeling paranoid? Eli questioned as he continued to walk forward. Well, friend, nowadays, one just never knows what may be attempting to breach one's home, can they? Eli smiled a forced grin. Once you've lost that home, you quickly realize... What the fuck does it all matter? Now, now, Eli. It sounds as if you are suffering one of those horrid lows. Paul reached into his pocket and slowly pulled a puppet pen and continued that fluid movement towards Eli in an offering gesture. Take a hit off this, my friend. It will settle your woes. Disguise them, you mean? He asked sarcastically as he stepped up in front of his friend covering the doorway. I'm done with that shit. Haven't you noticed the entire country is suddenly hooked on it? Hell, little old couples are flooding the dispensaries. Not just the young kids anymore. Paul smiled. Says a lot for the current state of this world's need for change, don't you think? Eli paused for a moment. He let a fleeting memory flitter around in the back corner of his mind. He suddenly felt like he was experiencing some sort of deja vu. He looked at Paul, and Paul's smile flattened out across his face. Oh, this seems serious, Eli. He stated with hesitation as his eyes began to squint at the possibility of trouble on the horizon. I don't believe I like this side of you I haven't seen. Eli raised his hand as if to calm his friend. I had the dream again last night, but this time... This time it was slightly different. And it's brought an air about you that is not acceptable, Eli. Paul spoke sternly. Invite me in and let's... Let's have a drink, Paul. I thought you gave that part of your life up. 
He reached his hand inside his pocket once more, retrieving the pen and slowly drawing it out to offer it once more. Eli slapped the pen from Paul's hand and it fell to the ground. Their eyes met and for the first time, there was a strong tenseness between their stares. I just fucking said that I don't want that shit anymore. It's still in my will to know what my reality is. His words cut through flesh and straight to the bone in a way that caused Paul's eyes to darken. Your reality, Eli? He questioned with what appeared to be a forced, softened tone. Your reality was dead before I took you under my wing. You seem to be spitting in my face. And I won't have it. He spoke with a coldness that appeared to draw an instant line in between them. Do you understand me, Eli? Paul, I understand that I asked if we could share a drink. I drove over here because I have nowhere else to go. I don't want any of your magic vape anymore. It's dull in my senses. It seems to me now that maybe that's the feeling you want me to have. The two stood in silence for several seconds. If that isn't the way you feel, Paul, then let's continue inside and pour that fucking drink. All right? Eli noticed something that he had never really taken in before. Something Paul had never spoken about. He kept the thought internal for the moment as he continued to let visions from that horrible moment the hooded goons entered the restaurant and drew their weapons. Well? Eli asked as he began to push forward into the entryway of Paul's home. I'm not sure this is a good idea, Eli. Maybe we should put this off for another time. The two were standing face to face, almost no space between them. Come on, old friend, just a drink, or possibly two. Then I'm back on my merry way. Eli knew where the bar and liquor cabinet was. While the two of them had not shared drinks for some time now, he did know that Paul only stocked the very best. And in this very moment in time, Eli craved the very best. Paul followed his friend down the hallway and to the right where his billiard room was. The room sat under a raised ceiling that was close to 25 feet overhead. There were built-in bookshelves that surrounded the room only broken up by stained glass windows sparsely laid out in the two walls facing the outside. Eli glanced around the familiar room at all the volumes of books. This was his favorite spot in Paul's home. There must be a million or more books in here, he stated. I've read every one of them, Eli. And yours? Yours are up in the top of stories that hold my attention the most. It's why I chose you. Chose me? Eli questioned as Paul pulled two crystal highball glasses from the shelf and then uncorked a dusty bottle he pulled from the top shelf. Oh, Eli, you're not really going to play that game, are you? That is a rabbit hole. Neither one of us needs to travel. Paul couldn't refrain from the slight hiss that followed his words. It came out like a forced lisp. Eli looked at the odd ring on Paul's little finger on his left hand. Just what does that pinky ring represent, Paul? I can't make out just what it is, and honestly, I never really noticed it or paid any attention to it. Paul glanced at the white gold ring on his finger as he held the bottle of 25-year-old Rip Van Winkle over each glass, letting it spill its very expensive liquid into each. He smiled at either the question Eli just asked him, or maybe it was because of taking in the caramel and vanilla nose. Sweet, yet mixed with that soft oak that let you know there would be a slight burn. Eli brought his hand towards Paul's left to pull the ring closer, but Paul quickly set a glass in his hand and then lifted his in a toast. Here's to knocking this world to its knees. And then making it what we want it to be. Paul spoke before bringing his glass towards Eli's. Making it what we want it to be? Eli bypassed clinking his glass to his friends and instead drew it to his nose and inhaled before quickly downing its contents and continuing. 
I never have known it was what we wanted it to be. This is all news to me, Paul. Eli breathed out as if his breath was slightly stolen from him for a brief moment. I have no desire to rule this world, Paul. In fact, I have no desire in tearing it down. I want no part of that crazy act. Eli set his glass down on the bar and reached for the bottle. I won't fucking help you, Paul. Your crazy notions are coming from left field. Are they now? Paul swallowed his drink and set his glass down to the bar, nodding for a refill. You're a smart man, Eli. You may have been denying to yourself of what we were doing, but I can't believe you never put it all together. You're letting your old wounds cloud your mind and desires. That's what I think. <laughs> Paul let out a rather odd cackle, and for the moment it didn't fit the mood. Eli lifted his glass again and took a sip this time. Just who the fuck are you, Paul? Paul swallowed his entire drink down once again before slapping onto the marble bar top. I could be your worst nightmare, Eli. I don't want that, but I do know exactly what I do want, and I chose you to help me achieve that. I know what you did, and I can imagine who, or better yet, what you are. Eli sipped from his drink again while Paul refilled his glass. As Paul lifted his drink once more, he spoke. I suppose this is the end of our friendship? He ended the statement with question. Think your answer over thoroughly, friend. Do you know what gave you away? Eli questioned. I have my ideas. That fucking ring on your pinky. Eli paused. He held an angered vengeance within his glare. I figured out just where I'd seen it before. When I saw you pull it out of your pocket to hand me your company's vape pen. Puppet core. You're present to steal the population's will. He slid his glass over to Paul to refill it. You tried to make me your puppet, but... I won't be your Pinocchio. And you sure as shit aren't Geppetto to me. I'm already a real boy. One without your strings attached. Eli shook his head in dismay, as if this conversation finally sealed what he had feared. It was fact. Paul had used him. It sucks that you never were what you pretended to be. My narrator. Ha! <laughs> what was the plan after you get what you want? You surely knew at some point your puppet would sever the strings. How are you going to get rid of me? Oh, Eli, Eli, tisk tisk. why do we have to go there? Let's just continue to let this thing play out. See how it, or sorts, in the end. I mean, I already have otherworldly powers. But you obviously have limitations too. Or you wouldn't even let me get to this point of calling you out. I keep hoping you'll come to your senses. You lost that hope when I realized you killed my family that day, you lying son of a bitch. You asked about my ring, Eli. Do you still have a curiosity of it? It won't make any difference in the way this ends. Oh, it might. It contains a single tear. One of Mary's. There was a long moment of silence. Mary's? My wife Mary? That can't be. I saw the ring on your finger at the restaurant when you drew your weapon and fired before she died. Oh, my Foolish Eli, do you really think this battle for the world is something new? It's been going on and on for many millennium. And I wasn't talking about your wife, Mary. What do you mean, not my wife, Mary? You said your ring held a tear of hers. I was referring to your mother's tear, Elijah. Eli's face became flushed and bright red with growing anguish and anger. So you killed my wife and son, 
And now you're insinuating my lineage goes back to biblical times? Eli's temples pulsated. And you were responsible for my mother's death also? Eli's hand snapped out in front of him and he clasped it around Paul's throat, piercing the skin of his neck and tightly drawing his fingers together in a vice grip. If you're human at all, you bastard, you'll die today by my hand. Eli's grip began to shake as a pain increased throughout his own entire body. He stared into Paul's graying eyes as they began to bulge before withering back. It didn't seem to matter how much strength Eli squeezed. Paul's face never changed. It remained focused without display of pain. Eli's grip began to fade, as did his will to remain this attempt that stood at a standstill. Eli's vision blurred, and he slipped back inside his head, picturing his wife and son being gunned down as he lay helpless in a pool of his own blood. The look of terror in Cole's eyes as his life slipped from his body right in front of Eli. Mary's hushed words attempting to escape, begging him to save their son in words that mutely screamed from her dying silence. His grip began to loosen. He could no longer maintain his hold. The power of the moment he was reliving internally was also the element robbing him of his ability to continue fighting his nemesis. The images of his wife and son, and that of whom he had known as his only friend, spun and mixed together in an indistinguishable medley of emotion and regret that relentlessly pummeled his psyche repeatedly as he gave in to submission. Eli's grip released completely, like a hawk no longer able to flap its wings and still maintain the hold of its prey tightly in its talons. All energy to carry on helplessly spilled from every spent muscle. <laughs> A deep, laughing hiss filled the large room completely until the sound echoed back down from the cathedral ceiling high above the bar. Paul's neck ached as the once restrained vessels now released a gorging river of blood being pumped back along with the much-needed air returning to his once starved lungs. Paul had been determined to show Eli no weakness, no matter what the cost. He held no idea of just how immortal he really was. He had never been held to any kind of challenge like Eli's ever before. He had always laid in the shadows of his puppet's subconscious in the past, not letting them become aware of his physical being. This attempt had been extremely different than any other from the past. This mission was not a total failure, although he would have to finish without the help of his little writing slave. Paul looked over at Eli as he still seemingly remained under stress and struggle. He sneered at Eli. You have been such a disappointment, Elijah. I was certain using someone of your heritage would be the ingredient that would add a finality to the final solution. But you are weak. Weak like your wife and your son. What a shame. What a fucking shame. Paul picked up his glass and poured one more shot to toast the demise of Elijah once and for all. After pouring the drink, he sidestepped back to where Eli leaned against the bar, breathing lightly, body trembling, as he whimpered. I thought you would at least perish like a man. <laughs> Paul cackled again in his devilish low grumble. <laughs> I might have guessed I would be let down. I'll take great pride in destroying your precious bike, your source of inspiration. <laughs> he cackled before he swallowed down the last of the elixir they had shared. His hand opened up and began reaching towards Eli's heart, prepared to rip the beating organ from his chest his cold eyes glowing blood red. Eli slowly reached towards his pocket carefully without giving any sight or hint as he retrieved a black object about four and a half inches long. As Paul reached in front of Eli towards his chest, Eli spun around and faced Paul, giving him surprise. 
As Paul's dark eyes opened wider in concern, Eli pushed the object into Paul's chest and pulled back on the button of the stiletto knife, causing the blade to instantly exit its handle. Eli pulled the blade out after it plunged into Paul's heart and repeatedly pushed it back in and out over and over while the narrator squealed and hissed like a balloon losing its air as it shrank. Six, seven, eight times more, the blade entered and exited his chest as he shrank back, falling to his knees, blood pouring and pumping from his body. Paul's final act was to plunge his fingers into Eli's chest as he yanked his heart with all his might while tumbling to the hard, blood-drenched floor. Eli and Paul were both laid out next to each other, both holding their chests as they slowly wound down like tops tired of fighting the momentum, realizing their ends were certainly coming too, both gasping and struggling with their circumstances. Eli's hands began to stretch out before him, and in quiet whispers, he spoke his wife and son's names. Mary. Cole. I'm... I'm coming. Coming. I, I've missed. Missed. He collapsed as he rolled down on his stomach, his blood-stained hands reaching out as if his family were helping him into the next life. Eli! Eli! Don't leave! Don't leave me! We... we can... still... change the... <laughs> A quiet dying hiss was all that remained. Home base, this is Charlie 7. Come in. Over. Narrator? Master Puppet, this is Charlie 7. Are you out there? Charlie 7, this is Echo 1. We have lost signal with the command home base. Come back. Charlie? This is Charlie? Echo 1 to Charlie? I hope you enjoyed The Narrator, as written by Eli Pope and performed by Paul J. McSorley, Drew Blood, Jeff Sturdevant, and Melissa Medina. Eli Pope is the multi-award winning author of the dark psychological series titled The Mason Jar Series. All five books in this saga can be found on Audible.com, narrated by myself, Paul J. McSorley. Book 6. The Call Home will be available soon. You can find more of me right here on our very own network, as well as over on Audible as mentioned. And be sure to check out Fear from the Heartland, which has over 120 episodes for you to love and enjoy. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. Oh, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for this evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>